So, um, hi everyone. Thank you very much for tuning into this week's webinar Wednesday. It's quite a special one because we have our very own Julian Bolding who will be the speaker. Um, you might know me by now. My name is Stephanie Fox. I'm going to be moderating the webinar. Um, just some housekeeping before I introduce Julian. Um, timings, we'll have a five minute introduction now. Uh, Julian will give a 35 minute presentation um, as long as he stays to time. Uh, we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A and we're aiming to finish by 1.55 p.m. London time so you can be ready for your next virtual appointment. So please do keep your microphones muted. Um, if we're gonna call on you to ask a question, we will unmute your microphone or you can unmute your microphone. But that being said, please do keep your videos on so Julian has some friendly faces to look at while he's talking. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A portion at the end, but if you think of a question while Julian is talking, uh, just send them to me directly in the chat. So to do this, go to your chat box where it says two, you should see a drop down menu and you just select Stephanie box instead of everyone. We'll go through all of the questions and we'll select a few to ask Julian once he's finished speaking. Um, so all questions should be sent to me in the chat box, not to, you know, everyone, because they'll get lost in the noise. Um, if you'd like to ask Julian the question yourself, just say, I'll ask, um, or something like that. If you prefer for me to ask for you, just say, just say so. Um, hopefully your speaker viewing mode is set to speaker view. Um, if not, just click speaker view at the top right of your screen. Julian's going to be sharing slides on his screen, so if you can't see his little speaker window when his slides are on the screen, just select Show Active Speaker Video. For any technical issues, please message Paul Squirrel directly in the chat, um, in the same way that you find me, or you can email Paul at paul.squirrel, S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-L, -L, at thenetwork1.com. We're recording this webinar and we will share the link of the recording with everyone afterwards. So if you prefer not to take notes, you don't need to. Um, and if for any reason the system crashes, just please use the unique link that you logged in with today. Thank you very much. Now I would like to introduce our speaker, the Network One's own Julian Balding. So Julian is president of the Network One, which he co-founded in 2003. Previously, Julian spent 14 years in a succession of senior roles at DMBMB Group, now part of Publicis. While with DMBMB, he lived and worked in the UK, Europe, Latin America, and the USA, coordinating international advertising campaigns for companies like Procter & Gamble, M&M Mars, Avon, and Philips Electronics. In 2002, Julian left the MBMB group to found the Network One, now the world's largest of independent marketing communications agencies, counting more than 200 active members and a further 1,000 accredited agencies in 109 countries worldwide. He's a member of the Marketing Society since 2006, a director since 2011, and now an elected fellow, board member, and honorary treasurer. He's closely involved with the Marketing Society's international relations and expansion into India, Hong Kong, Singapore, UAE, USA, and other new markets. He is also a freeman of the Washburn Company of Marketers in the City of London. Julia is a regular creative, re regular speaker at global and regional industry events, including the Cannes Festival of Creativity, Psyched Asia, Ad Asia, AdFest, the ICO Global Summit, and the Homes Global PR Summit in Washington, D.C. Finally, Julian is a graduate of Cambridge University in the UK. So without further ado, I will now turn over to Julian. So thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, it is quite strange to have yourself introduced uh, when you spend uh, more time introducing other people, I think. Um, but it's great to, to see so many people and it really brings those kind of numbers to life and uh, all of those trips um, that uh, Paul and I and the rest of the team have spent um, traveling the world to meet people. So it's really great to see so many people from so many different countries um, here on the webinar today. Um, so usually, of course, at this time of year, um, we enjoy uh, a week in the south of France um, at the Cannes Lions Festival. Of course, as I explained to my family, it's entirely work, uh, but it's actually somewhere where we have made a lot of contacts and met a lot of agencies uh, over the years who have become um, members, friends, collaborators, um, and uh, 
all amazing, wonderful people. And uh, it is a little bit of fun too. But of course this year, this year is very different in so many ways and Cairns is one of those. Um, first of all, the Cairns Lions decided to postpone its festival until October. And then as the date started to get nearer, it realized even that with all the um, uh, logistics involved would not be possible. So they've uh, postponed the festival until uh, its usual time, but next year. Um, one of the things which I usually do um, or have done for many years is write a little review of what I learned and what I heard at the Cannes Festival. Obviously, I can't do that this year, um, but uh, it seemed a shame to let the opportunity go. So what I thought it might be helpful to do, and this is the basis of this seminar, um, is just go back over uh, many of the different uh, webinars, which um, some of which we have done ourselves, uh, others of which being done by, by the Cannes Lions themselves, by Campaign, by uh, The Drum, by uh, Jack Myers in the US, um, and by people in different parts of the world, and try and pick out uh, some pictures about where the agency ecosystem stands today. So that is really the theme of my, of my talk. Um, and I'll share the screen because we do have some slides. There we go. So yes, there, there we are. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the little bit that says, not the Cannes Review 2020. Um, so sadly, no South of France, no sunshine, no beautiful blue sea, um, but some interesting things about how other people have approached the issue and their experiences during the pandemic. Um, one thing we did find, uh, let's see how I go forward here, there we go, um, is that one or two people made it to Cannes. Actually, as far as we know, only two, um, one of, both of whom were from the publicist group. And this is uh, what they did. They actually hired um, the huge auditorium where they usually present the awards. And uh, just two of them, Arthur Sadoun, the CEO, and um, Maurice Levy, the previous CEO, uh, gave a presentation to an empty hall. And it was kind of bittersweet. You kind of half admired them for the chutzpah of doing it. And uh, you half felt, my goodness, is this uh, an image of the agency world? Uh, here are the big, uh, proud companies uh, talking to an empty space. And uh, I must admit, I had a, a little bit too feelings about that. Um, but nevertheless, you know, there were no lions at Cannes, um, but there have been some awards. And what we usually do with the Cannes Review is to start with, you know, who won the big prizes. And uh, this one is the one that caught my eye. Um, it's uh, quite a well-known film. We're not going to look at the whole campaign, but if you haven't seen it, it's the one where um, they have a time-lapse photography of a Burger King Whopper uh, going moldy um, and disintegrating before your eyes. And uh, the one show, which is in New York, it's the big kind of creative show in New York, is probably the biggest show that's awarded prizes so far this year and it was the big winner there. So what does it say about us and our industry and where we stand? Um, for me, it says some slightly worrying things. Um, it makes us think, is this really what advertising should be doing? Or is it something which has got stopping power but doesn't have an effect on clients' business in a positive way? Um, and uh, certainly they made a big thing of it. This is Arthur Sadoun, he's actually got um, uh, Mark Reed, the CEO of uh, WPP, um, in lockdown at home, uh, talking to him because both of their agencies were involved in the making of that particular Burger King film. So this is like the, the big show of the networks. Is it right? Is it not? I don't know. Here's something I found quite interesting. Um, uh, Walk, which is the advertising research organization that runs the Advertising Effectiveness Awards, um, asked took this shot, which is uh, from um, part of the campaign. It's a, it's a bus shelter poster of the Moldy Whopper and asked a behavioral economist, um, someone who's well known to us, Phil Barden, this is him speaking at our Indy Summit a few years back, uh, to just say what he thought. And he wrote a terrible piece um, that said why it didn't work and explained that, yes, if you intellectualize it, um, it may be helpful. Uh, because it does say that the Whopper has no um, artificial ingredients and preservatives. But your mind doesn't work that way. It looks at an image and it goes, oh, that's disgusting. 
and you associate it with the brand's logo. And then you've got to hope that somebody is reading the small print to get kind of the joke. And it just seemed to me a little bit with these two things, there's a huge lack of direction in the industry. You know, are we talking to an empty room? Are we running ads for ourselves that amuse us as an industry, but don't actually support the client's brand? It made me wonder. Um, let's move on because what I want to spend the rest of this presentation on is a look at uh, you know, what we might call the agency ecosystem today. Where do we as independents uh, stand within the system? Who is doing well? Who is doing less well? Um, and where do we see this taking us and where do we see the opportunity for independence? Which we'll come to the independence at the end. Um, and I first thing I wanted to say is, you know, there are kind of five real franchises. There's the technology platforms, the Google, the Facebook, um, the Amazon, uh, the Chinese rivals, uh, WeChat and Alibaba. Um, there's the traditional holding companies that have dominated the agency business for a lot of my career, um, the WPPs, the Publicis, the Omnicoms, uh, the IPGs. There's in-house agencies, uh, which certainly in the States are rising fast in size and influence. Um, there are the consulting firms like Accenture and Deloitte, who've really got the headlines in the last couple of years, mostly through buying leading independent agencies like Droga5, like Karmarama, like Colorado, like the Monkees, uh, like Shackleton. Um, and last uh, but not least, there's the independents. So how does this fit together and how does the industry as a whole doing? Let's look at the parts and see how they stack up. Okay, the tech platforms first. Um, James Murphy, who ran probably one of the best ever independent agencies in the UK, Adam and Eve, sold it for a huge amount of money to D DDB, uh, where they continued successfully until uh, he left again to start his new agency, which uh, is about uh, three weeks old. But in the interim, um, he was on gardening leave as chairman of the UK Advertising Association. And he made this point, he goes, even the biggest agencies we have are SMEs in the real world. So whatever we think we might do to shape our destiny, however, sometimes we might think, you know, gosh, how do we compete with, you know, an Ogilvy, a BBDO, um, or one of the big holding agencies. You know, let's all remember, we're actually all small. And so this is a graph I've shown on, on several occasions because until you kind of look at this, you don't really realize, you know, we think Publicis and WPP and Omnicom are big, but this is their market value, market capitalization. Um, so that's, the, that's what it would cost to buy all their shares on the stock market today, in theory. Um, and we just see how tiny they have become. You know, even Accenture is more than 10 times the biggest of the holding companies. Uh, Facebook is, you know, it's 671 billion is what, 60, 70 times uh, the size of WPP. And Google is 100 times the sub size of WPP. And Amazon is now, what, 150 times the size of WPP. I do hope I've got the maths right. Um, but the point is the scale. It's, it, we, are, we are small fish in this big pool. And all of us need to be agile and smart and clever to survive. Don't ever believe that uh, those holding companies have the scale to fight the big players. Um, and the big players are doing incredibly well. Um, Paul makes this chart for me quite regularly and updates it. And the picture is, is always the same. This is, this is the last three years before the pandemic. And what it shows is the change in value. So it starts on the left-hand side of the graph uh, zero, at a zero point, um, And it shows the rise or fall in the value of the companies. And what we see is obviously the Dow Jones, the kind of the biggest stock market indicator, uh, you know, has risen significantly. It's about, it was about 20% up, 20-25% uh, up during that period. Um, but Facebook, Google, Amazon, all well ahead. Um, so what happened to those stocks in the, in the pandemic? Because a fashionable stock usually falls in a crisis. So yes, they fell, everybody fell. But what happened was they didn't fall that far. They did fall, Amazon less, because obviously the business model is more e-commerce driven and e-commerce had a boost during the pandemic. Um, but Facebook and Google you know, went below that line. They were about 30% off their base. 
they're um, at uh, in the early part of March, which was really the height of the market crash. Um, but look how quickly they have recovered. So if we look at where they were a couple of days ago. Uh, you know, they are now um, 10, 15 percent above where they were at the beginning of the pandemic. They're above that. They're not just caught it up like Dr. and Gamble or Unilever or some of the big companies. They've overtaken it. And Amazon is shooting ahead. It's worth more than 50 percent, more than it was worth on the 1st of January this year. So the tech stocks are huge and growing very fast. If I turn to look at the holding companies, uh, which if you like are probably our more direct competition, we see something quite different. Um, we see and we read there's a shift away from the agency holding companies from a client perspective. Um, the lack of transparency, uh, much highlighted in media buying, but in other areas as well, has eroded trust with the clients. It's more than just a media buying problem. There's a belief that the holding company model is self-serving. It is growing shareholder value as opposed to stakeholder value. Um, and that is like a big shift that we see in the industry. As we care more about social responsibility, we see that move towards shareholder value is, and short-term growth are not enough. We see their declining pro profitability. We see them losing senior people to save costs. Um, we start to realize that the buy now, pay later model, as in other words, you grow through acquisition rather than organic growth, is unsustainable in low growth economies and the markets have lost confidence. And just look at the numbers. This is the three year chart and you can see where the tech companies are up, how far the WPP and Publicis fell by the end of last year. So they're about both about 40% where they were three years ago, lost 40% of their value. Now let's look at what happened to them in the pandemic. Um, and that's, the, that's where we see it on the big chart, but I'm actually going to show two smaller charts which are indicative of what's really happened. Um, the first one is, uh, this is um, Facebook. So look at what happened with Facebook. So Facebook uh, started the year at about, uh, about five eighty five ninety billion dollar value. Um, it fell uh, quite significantly in the crash. Um, so it has lost something maybe 30% in the, in the crash, but it's already see the curve when it goes back up. Even Facebook, which has got problems at the moment uh, with uh, you know, PR and uh, you know, hate speech and uh, backlashes and boycotts, it's still 15% above where it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Look at uh, WPP, which is fairly representative. Publicists wouldn't be much different and um, Omnicom uh, not a lot different either. It's lost half its value and it's still only worth half what it was. It's worth just over 9 billion and it was worth 18 back in January. So after losing 30% gradually over the years, it's now lost half its value and it's not going up anytime soon. And its pattern is very clear on this. Um, as Arthur Sadoon said in the note uh, published yesterday, uh, leaked by um, Publicis of uh, his internal staff memo, we have very tough days ahead. Um, that's Arthur in lockdown. This is Mark Reed in lockdown at home. And uh, he said something quite amazing when interviewed by the drum. He said, we need to think more like a company and less like a group. Um, as Rene Fisher put it, if some of you saw, saw this, uh, this um, seminar, which he gave, the way traditional agencies work simply makes no sense to startups. He was talking about startups. The model is wrong. Everybody knows it. The market has lost confidence. It will cause us problems potentially, but it also brings us opportunities. Um, let's look at the, uh, a little more briefly at the other two big franchises, the in-house agencies, um, and then the consulting firms. So in-house agencies, um, you know, they are hugely gaining momentum. It began in the US as the ANA, the clients organization, um, took on the agencies, uh, a, what, three, four years ago, mostly over transparency. And they have systematically attacked the big agency groups, um, helping them, helping them to lose trust from clients. Um, they lack the first person data, which clients are increasingly using to drive their business. And there's a big shift on the client side towards um, 
uh, towards direct to consumer marketing, you know, not just uh, the e-commerce companies, but even people like PepsiCo are making big investments in this. Um, the IP protection issues, cost efficiency, long-term planning, these are all things which they are finding it uh, easier to do if you move your business in-house. Um, it's a danger for us, but it's also an opportunity as we'll see. Um, just some numbers to demonstrate this. 72% you know, of US corporations now have an in-house agency, and that's up 12%. That's from Forrester Research Company just before the pandemic. Um, David Indo um, runs a media consultancy for media buying agencies, and he says the decision on in-housing for a client is based on the value of the task, so a high value task is more likely to be taken in-house, and the complexity of the task, a more awkward and difficult task, may be more likely to be outsourced. So which would you rather have, what the client really thinks is important or what the client thinks is a pain in the ass? Uh, not doesn't all go well. Um, we saw this scene at our last um, uh, Indie Forum in Cannes last year. Obviously this is where we'd like to be this year, but we ain't. Um, and two people, the two people in the middle of the speaker panel, um, both good friends of ours, you know, Dick Van Motman, who at the time was the creative managing director of Dentsu Worldwide, um, at, next to Marla Kaplovitz, uh, the head of the four A's with the loudspeaker. And Dick's kind of definition was an agency, an agency is an extension of the client's marketing team. Um, and Marla's was, no, no, an agency's value is in being an external voice. Um, it's a really interesting debate. I think most of us as independents would probably vote for the second, and we are with Marla. Um, but that's traditionally how agencies operate, and that is how the agencies, the big group groups, achieve scale through doing a lot of the kind of tasks that could be in-house and creating uh, a lack of a division between agency and client, whereas there is a real value, as you know, we've all seen, in being an external voice. Um, there is, of course, you know, the last problem. This is a lovely quote I couldn't help putting in uh, from Katie Dulake in our uh, seminar recently with the clients. And, uh, you know, she said at the end of the day, you know, uh, Stephen, she was talking to Stephen Mayer, um, it's, uh, you know, we can all argue about in-house and uh, external, but for me, it's very hard to get cutting edge creative talent to come and live in rural Gloucestershire in the small village in the west of England where Mitsubishi uh, has its uh, headquarters. Um, so let's move on. Let's look at, look at consulting firms for a minute. Um, what I found most interesting when I started to look at this is not the stuff we all know, which is, you know, the, the, the marquee signings, you know, the Galacticos and the, the David Droger and the Karl Marama. It's the way that Accenture, who you would think of as being a quite dry and objective company, is investing in creating emotional bonds uh, with, with their clients. Um, and if we look at how they're promoting themselves, it's quite extraordinary um, how they are looking to create softer feel and empathy um, in the way that they project themselves. So I'm just gonna, gonna show you a little film they're making about themselves. Hopefully. Yes. We have big and beautiful technology at our fingertips. We can use it for good, for evil, or the trivial. But is it enough to make toasters that tweet, washers that text? We're making it our mission to create experiences that improve lives, to make shopping for what's healthy as easy as a swipe, to add empathy to the immigration process, finding the perfect look without the wardrobe changes. These we've made real, but we're passionate about doing more. Something bigger than a commercial or tweet. Because brands are built on experiences. This is a challenge for us all to invent new ways to collaborate with our clients, our partners, and each other. To disrupt and change the way we experience everything. To harness the power of technology and humanity to create something daring, something disruptive, something big. And to make something meaningful for all of us. And there's another video, I'm just gonna show you a couple of 
minutes at the beginning because, or, or less than that because of, of time. This is Julie Sweet, who's the CEO of Accenture in North America. Um, and this is a film that she had made about herself. And uh, it's just interesting, the tonality about how she talks. Oops, it's blank play there. If your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Hello, my name is Julie Sweet. I'm CEO of Accenture North America. And one of the things I tell my people is to be fearless, but prepared. And I had something called the why rule when I was a young lawyer. I would sit on a call and if I didn't understand why a client or a partner said something, I would write it in a book and then I would go ask why. And it's how I learned to be a great lawyer, to be a business person. I did it when I, for each of my career transitions, to be successful, whatever your specialization, you have to constantly be refreshing your knowledge. I try to teach my daughters that, first of all, they need to believe in themselves and it's okay to have dreams and aspirations that feel kind of hard because that's how you succeed and you reach for things. But I'm going to just pause it there, but the point we're looking at is, do we know anything about the families, the personalities of the the men who run um, Omnicom and WPP and the other holding companies? No, these are, this is going for empathy. It's telling her about herself. She goes on to talk about when she had cancer, about her vulnerabilities, about her family. And it's, that's creating an image for Accenture, which the holding companies simply don't have. And it's one of the major reasons why they're out of touch. The interesting thing about Accenture mm -hmm. is this. Um, if any of you saw, there's actually a picture of Jack at the, um, at the Indie Summit in, in Beijing last year. Um, and he does an unbelievably interesting analysis of the consulting firms um, against, uh, against the holding companies. Um, and uh, it's often available online and it's well worth signing up for. It's usually free of charge. If not, we'll, we'll find a way to make that happen. Um, but what he looks at, he partly looks at how Accenture's business model, which is twice as profitable as an agency, and all of the consulting firms, uh, they look for about 40 to 45% margin on their business, whereas an agency is really aiming at 15 to 20% most of the time. What do they do? Of course, they have, you know, they have more focus, they have more efficiency, they bring teams into longer term projects, they put them in the client's office, um, for 12 or 14 weeks at a time where they can build relationships, work together, get to know the clients. There's none of this, you know, go away and come back three weeks later. There's none of this, oh, today I'm on this flight, Next tomorrow I'm on this client, next week I'm doing something else. It's all about focus and efficiency, but what also happens is it builds trust and empathy. So their business model, their operational model, helps them to build trust and empathy with clients. Um, they are probably losing a little momentum in the uh, pandemic right now because they can't get to the clients. Um, so they're having to do video conferences like the rest of us. But it is a real lesson for us, you know, how you structure the way that you work with a client uh, to be able to build empathy and trust. Very instructive. Um, but let's, you know, last but not least, let's turn to us. Let's turn to the independents. Uh, what do we see if we look at the independent agencies today? Um, some of the things you'd probably expect. Um, yeah, we see them as future-facing, and a data-driven company is inherently less future-facing because data is about the past. And this is David Droger, who did sell his agency to Accenture, but um, he was talking last year about why Accenture paid such a sum of money for it. And he said, people hire me for my opinions. I mean, like, sounds arrogant. You know, I just sold it for $250 million or what, I don't know what he sold it for. Um, and he said, but actually, what does it mean? It means they're not hiring him for a looking at the past. They're looking at uh, hiring him for a judgment he's making on the future. And that is really critical for independent agencies. And we, as people who are not subject to uh, the vagaries of the stock market, whose CEOs are not going to be fired if we miss our quarterly numbers two quarters in a row, have an opportunity here. Um, the other thing I've noticed is, you know, a lot of independents, not a lot, but a good number of independents are starting to develop interests they have into additional business uh, ex centers of expertise. So if some of you have seen a good few of our webinars, you'll have seen um, 
Ran and Eller at Perceptor in Tel Aviv, who've uh, had a good corporate PR business for many years and have now developed a specialty in personal branding um, to bring out their corporate branding expertise. Russell Goldsmith, who's uh, um, a sound producer for many, many years, uh, has a business running, um, creating podcasts and explains brilliantly you know, how a podcast is a great new business tool. Happy to touch on that later if any of you haven't seen this. Um, and then uh, Nick and Joanna from 3 uh, another classic PR agency, but are now uh, running a division of that that helps people who don't know how to leverage their presence on Amazon, increasingly uh, vital medium um, to do so. Um, we saw this as well, and I, I won't play her video as well because we'll run short of time, but this is um, Rama Mosley, uh, who came and talked to us right in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, she runs a uh, film production company working with young talent, with Gen Z talent. So kids who are, you know, anything from 15, um, legal and proper, don't get me wrong, um, upwards, uh, up to about early 20s. And um, a lot of them shoot themselves. You know, you've seen it, the Instagrams of the videos and all of this. And she just came uh, and said, look, could I give a talk to people? Because I think it would be really helpful about how to shoot without a crew or a lighting cameraman or a sound person. Um, and she developed, uh, you know, within weeks, uh, a, a real expertise of that. Letterbox shooting, they could put the cable through the letterbox and the guy stands outside giving the directions on the monitor. Um, it's a new time, it's a new skill. Um, um, this, is, this, is one, this is the one we, we began our kind of um, pandemic newsletters with. Uh, it was a guy who was outside my house and he was, came to the door and he said, these vegetables, we had sold these um, to local restaurants which now cannot open and uh, they'll be thrown away. Um, so we've taken them around to sell them to people so that uh, we wouldn't be wasting food in a, in a tough time for everybody. And I thought, yeah, that is interesting. And that is like local, that it made me think about the importance and the, and the, and the rising importance of local against global, because that in a way is our biggest opportunity as independents. Um, there's many aspects of this. Uh, if we think about it, we could easily name seven or eight. And these are ones that I wrote down in 30 seconds, you know, uh, less air miles, you know, less food miles. Why do we have to eat food brought across from halfway across the world for our own vanity so we can eat uh, stuff that is out of season anyway? You know, secure supply chains. I mean, everything is made in China, but the problem with the car factories was they suddenly realized they couldn't get the components because China closed the borders, had to run very fast. Um, if they had something a little more local, they would have been uh, that return of a national consciousness. There's, you know, there's bad sides of this, to our opinion, um, as major countries, to name no, no names, uh, start to look inwards and protect and promote their own interests, as opposed to uh, belonging to global organizations and global initiatives. Um, you know, there's a cultural understanding. I mean, today we want to talk to people. We don't want to be uh, lectured like some enormous group. Uh, customer experience, personalization, Interactivity works better at a local level than someone who doesn't speak your language and is 10,000 miles away, you know, and a rapid test and learn. There is, I do believe there is a real shift of balance um, from global to local, and it's a huge opportunity for us as independent agencies. Um, these are just a few examples, and I've deliberately taken them from, uh, from screen grabs. Um, this was Tarek Fontenelle, who came to talk to us mainly about Black Lives Matter. But he also talked about how they understand people on the street, especially Gen Z, because they go out and talk to them, whereas agencies traditionally sit in their office and read reports. Uh, you know, he creates exchanges, not transactions. Uh, you know, he exchanges something which is useful for them and a dialogue rather than try and see them as a number on an e-commerce spreadsheet. Um, this was an early one from Elise Mitchell. Uh, who's run several PR agencies. And uh, she talked about what did she do in the pandemic? She wrote handwritten letters um, to all of her clients, uh, as opposed to you know, the old adage of mass personalization, which is a quite different thing from a personal touch. Um, this is Mary Portis, who's a very famous uh, retail shopping guru in the UK. She's identified this thing, which a lot of people are talking about now called the kindness economy, just actually being nice to real people you know, and she talks about shops and malls that got the physics right, you know, the numbers and the structures and the logistics and the chemistry wrong. And so many uh, retail stores are in crisis now because they don't add the value that would stop people from going to e-commerce. 
Um, Spencer Gallagher talked about uh, where new business really comes from. And this is one of the phrases I stuck in my mind. He said, you know, the biggest, bigger agencies get, the worse they get at asking existing clients for recommendations. Why? Because people don't have the relationship with their clients who they see week in, week out that would give them the trust to ask for recommendation. Agencies don't do it. Why not? Because they've got somehow or another distanced and alienated from clients. Um, these two people I loved, you know, they, uh, this is a rare shot of Swedes smiling, um, but uh, they gave the first seminar. They were the people who uh, work for Doconomy, which is the credit card that stops you spending when you reach your monthly carbon footprint limit. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an ecological uh, initiative. Um, but it wasn't that that caught me. It's, it's, Johan came up with this brilliant definition, which is creativity is about thinking up new things. Innovation is about doing new things. And I think this is a, a, a real issue today when clients are distanced and lacking trust with agencies who don't see them and spend time with them enough. They're not involved in following stuff through. You know, and Cannes is a festival of creativity but perhaps not a festival of innovation. And uh, yeah, Johan goes on to say, you know, lots of people talk about innovation, but very few want to do the work. And it's a big thing for an agency to want to do, to not just have a great idea, but to work with the client to make it happen. Um, the independent agencies, yeah, we, this was a, a speech by um, Luca Delana, who's uh, at the Nudge Stop Festival, which is a brilliant online conference uh, about behavioral economics. And, um, you know, he says, if you, the emotional associations with the action involved have more impact than emotional associations with the outcome. Um, so what does that mean? It means, uh, when you, to take an English example, when the government told us that we had to sing the national anthem twice while washing our hands, it told us um, how long we should spend washing our hands for that to be in effective against the virus but it was something that involved us. And when a government puts up statistics about how many cases or how many deaths, it doesn't really impact us. So it's the involvement, it's the personal involvement in things. And he will go on to show how different areas of the brain process these different things. But it is about people working with people and it's the emotional insight and emotional involvement in the process. As Peter Comber, a longtime friend of ours, just written a book called Collaborative Creativity. He says it's the IKEA effect. People attribute greater value to things they had a hand in creating themselves. Um, and this is kind of the last quote of, the, of this, which is, which is from Dan Ariely, who's um, yeah, probably the most famous conference speaker that I've heard over the last weeks. Um, he's actually doing free stuff from his mother's kitchen because he's gone back to Tel Aviv, uh, his hometown, to help, uh, help the Israeli government um, deal with the social issues of, uh, around the pandemic and how you uh, influence people into responsible behavior. And he says resilience can only be built through collaboration, no exceptions. And so I think that's uh, you know, quite a nice note to end on as we think where we're going. You know, it is a new model for clients, the independent agencies. It does work with in-house resources. It, it, it connects the two, the former problems of this connectivity are solved in the era of mass tech communications. And you know, as Dan says, you know, resilience is about collaboration with each other, with ourselves, with people in other countries and with clients. That's my take on the ecosystem today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julian, that was brilliant. Um, we've had a couple of questions in. Um, so someone has said, uh, do you think that the holding companies um, will have to be broken up to be more profitable in the future? Um, I think it's almost too late for that. Uh, this is being talked about. Martin Sorrell gave a talk recently, and um, you know, he's, uh, we know what when Sir Martin is, is about. He's you know, disillusioned and sour, as Arthur Sardin called him, um, and he wants to see them fail. Uh, but people have tried to do that. MDC, which brought up many of the best uh, agencies in the US, you know, Crispin Porter, uh, Kirschenbaum Bond, and, and people like this, have tried to sell off the parts, but they can't. Nobody wants to buy those parts. And if a business is going down, I think it's more like Kodak. The business model is actually shot. 
and uh, I, I don't see there's I genuinely don't see there's a long-term future for the holding companies 10-15 years out from here. Interesting. Um, someone else has said when agencies in-house staff is there a danger they can go native and put the client's interests before the agencies? Ah, absolutely that's a good one. I remember suggesting that to my old bosses when I worked for a big agency and they said yeah we've caught, we've caught on that one. Um, the thing that Accenture do, which is clever, is they don't put them in long enough. Yep. So they'll put them in a typically on a 12 to 14 week assignment, which is enough to bond with people, but it's enough to, not enough to start thinking that you really are employed by Accenture and not by, sorry, by the client and not by Accenture. So it, it, it can happen, yes, but um, keep them in for not too long because otherwise they will. You inevitably bond with the people that you work with and see every day. Um, so it's the, it's the timing that is the issue there. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so someone else has said, uh, the industry has changed a lot during lockdown and pitching is arguably even harder. What advice would you give to independent agencies to set themselves apart? Um, I think, well, you know, remember the, com remember the bonds and the commitments that you already have. Um, so as you... An independent agency usually offers more consistency than a large corporate company does. Um, so what does that mean? It means that you know, most of you work, uh, you either are leaders or owners of your businesses or you work closely with people who are. And that consistency allows an agency to build bonds with clients. And a client isn't just a client today, but you know, as we saw in Spencer's seminar, you know, it's the old business is the new business. So. I think we often have better and deeper relationships of trust with clients um, that will give us the license uh, to call and offer our services to help without being suspected of being you know, self-interested chances. Uh, so uh, use that, I would say, you know, look at your old clients, do nice things to them, be like Elise and send them handwritten notes. Um, yeah, there's nothing better than somebody who thinks they might have forgotten you because you haven't seen them recently. Uh, so I think there is an advantage. It's the personal relationships, but they need to be used and uh, the clients will welcome that. Uh, in practical terms, I mean, the great thing now, uh, often, um, especially in the US and uh, I don't know where else, but certainly in the US and to some extent in other places as well, pitching is so expensive. You know, there is an expectation you're going to a lot of work for free, a lot of um, research for free, uh, shoot demo films, do research, box pops all around the world. Um, and it's got impossibly expensive uh, for many independent agencies to compete for business. The great thing today is you can't, it's all on Zoom. You can't fly people all over the place. You can't shoot kind of fancy films to the same extent. So it has to some degree level the playing field and, uh, and help to get people in front of each other. And, you know, that impressive office, you know, that you might think, God, wow, I'd love to, I'd be really, you know, something working with an agency in Madison Avenue with the fantastic Mad Men kind of uh, backdrops. Um, well, frankly, you know, you know look, at, look at mine and look at Steph's and, uh, you know, these are normal houses or flats or apartments. Um, it is a leveler in, in some ways. And I think let's, let's try and, you know, use that advantage. Agreed. Thanks. Um, so someone else has said, do you see the possibility of a hybrid of independent agencies and consulting firms as the future of independence? Um, I don't see it as a future, but I do see it as an opportunity. Um, you see, one of the things about the consulting firms is, and I think we're probably primarily talking about Accenture and then to a lesser extent, um, Deloitte and then somewhere further down EY and um, uh, PwC maybe. Uh, what they've done is they tended to go for the superstar creatives. So they've bought people in the major centers where they're going to make the most money and where most of the clients will come from. So that's where the acquisitions have taken place. You know, they haven't gone and bought a, a, a smart little agency in Slovenia. You know, they've bought in, in London and Paris and Munich and uh, Sydney and New York. Um, so if you are in one of those places, it's tough. If you're not in one of those places, it is an opportunity because they will still need local insight and local empathy. And I would definitely think it's worthwhile to make, to make these connections because they will have offices 
in most of the countries of everybody on this call. Um, but they won't necessarily have creative people. They won't necessarily have people with insight and psychological and behavioral uh, expertise. They'll have more uh, technology people and you know, making systems work. So I think there is quite an opportunity to do that. And indeed, you know, we're in close touch with some of the agencies who've been sold to the big companies, notably uh, Karmarama and Colorado, who are members of Network One for many years. And uh, yeah, they said, we don't want to lose touch with you because we know we're going to need help of people with creative and insight skills in different countries. Great, thank you. Um, I agree. I think that, you know, the marriage of the two, the technology and the creative side and the empathy, um, it's, it's a really good idea. Um, so someone else has said, um, if you were to start an agency today, what kind of agency would you start? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, what I would not do, I would not start S4 Capital or indeed, you know, B5 Capital or anything of this nature, uh, because it just doesn't seem to me productive to go around building an agency by buying people. You know, um, there are times when you need to buy a capability and um, yeah, for sure, you know, acqui hires as, as sometimes it's called, you know, if you buy a little company of four people because three of them have got the skills that you need, sure, that makes sense. Um, but to build a holding company, that is what I would not do. So what kind of agency would we start? Um, Right now, I'd probably start something in, well, I don't know, if you asked me six months ago, I would have said uh, the field of experience and experiential um, and brand experience, uh, you know, the out, out of the box, the whole kind of uh, gestalt of, um, of the uh, different part, different aspects of communication from product to packaging, uh, with services, it's more like service design. You know, what is the design of the service from the moment I need or the moment I think I may have a need to the delivery of that need? These are kind of critical things and they are not ads. You know, there's a funny phrase at the moment going around, acts, not ads. And it's applied to what we should be doing in a pandemic, but it's not related to the pandemic alone. It's related to what clients actually need. Think of what Johan and uh, Matthias said about building something that stays with a client um, in that way. I think that's what the more advanced countries, especially the Nordics, are really focusing on, pivoting their agencies to change to that experience. Now, some of that experience has to be online, but you know, an online or phone experience or what happens when the delivery people come. I mean, have you noticed how many, how the delivery people are friendly now? They used to just yeah. shout the stuff at you, you know, <laughs> and now they come and smile at you. You know, they stand you know, three meters away, um, but they smile at you. They're pleased to see you. And it was not nice to them because they're nice to you and it's, it's natural. Uh, so yeah, think about the customer experience because the customer's need for experience is changing too. And there's an expectation that people should be nice to you whereas there wasn't. Uh, um, two years ago, I went to a, a lecture, I don't know, one of the tech conferences, and the guy who had started Deliveroo, you know, just big uh, food delivery uh, firm in uh, this part of the world and many other parts too, yeah, he said um, he naturally, as the owner of the firm, he said, I must, I must live the experience. So I'm going to do deliveries myself. So he spent a week delivering food. Absolutely, totally the right thing for him to do. And he started to try and engage the people in conversation. Uh, when he delivered the food. And he said they were all thoroughly unreceptive because all they wanted was to grab the thing, pay the money uh, and you know, take it and go away and start eating. Um, and he might've been a little naive, but it was quite an eye opener for him. But I think that's that feeling of you know, engagement and not just transactions is a, a social change and an opportunity. So how, do we, how would we start to leverage that and how would we start to contribute into it as well as as you know, as as step back from it, yeah, and stop this kind of thing of living in an ivory tower. You know, you fly into a new city, you get in a taxi, you go to the client's office, you spend the whole day there. Uh, they probably bring in lunch, and then you get in the taxi and you get back to the airport. I mean, what do you know about that country? How are you going to advise that the client in that country on what to do when you haven't done, seen anything except the inside of a fancy taxi? I mean, no, get on the subway. Get engaged, you know, be like Tarek Fontenelle and hang around in uh, you know, Brixton and Blackstock Road and all the dodgy parts of London where Lizzie tells us they have illegal street parties. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, just get engaged. 
get engaged, but this is what local is about. This is what being independent and in a community is about. It's what being, you know, I don't mean small, we have to be small because you can't want to be small, but don't lose, don't lose the, the people side, the personal side of knowing people and then you will be nice to them. You know, the whole, remember the, the old centurion principle, why did the Roman army have such success? Because they split the army into groups of a hundred because if people were groups of a hundred, they would fight and die for one another. When it was more than that, you didn't really know the people who were in the, you know, the, the, the unit to your left, so you would not die for them. Um, and some agencies have run that principle. You know, Taxi in Canada was famous for not having more than 100 people. And if they had 100 people, then they started another agency for 101 to work with. Megara Jesse, we work with in Austin, Texas, has done the same thing. Um, keep small, keep ways to be small. If you are big, find ways to divide yourself into smaller units. Definitely. I think that human connection right now is more important than ever. So really good advice. Um, we've got time for about two more questions. So I know that Mike Gibson wanted to ask a question. Mike, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Julian, thank, thank you very much for that. Your reports from CAN over the years have always been the best. And again, your uh, not CAN's report this, this year has also been very insightful. Um, I take your point about globalization and the excess of crazy food miles. But globalization has also helped bring many people out of poverty. It's opened us up to other cultures, international cooperation and sharing. How do we find the balance? Well, I think the word, the balance is in the word that you used. It's, it's cooperation. If you are, uh, you, there's so much talk at the moment about the damage caused by acquisitive colonialism. You know, slavery, if you like, is, a, is part of that. And people are pulling down statues, and you know, in many cases, r rightly so. Um, this doesn't mean I don't think you know people should feel they have to apologise for something that was done by by their ancestors two hundred years ago, of which they clearly have no influence. But it does. It, it is. It is a way of looking at things like ownership and control, as opposed to cooperation and and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you see it. Uh, very overtly in a lot of traditional colonialism and you see it uh, in a different and more subtle way in the way that you know some powerful countries not to name anyone in particular but you know are investing in producing in providing loans for um, less wealthy countries to develop facilities you know ports infrastructure roads which they need um, and there's a fine line between doing something uh, which is there to genuinely help uh, the people in the uh, less wealthy country, um, but without simply mortgaging them to the extent that, uh, you know, 10 years later, they have to give you the stuff that you can't pay for, and you now own chunks of their infrastructure, and for you to use in ways that benefit you and not, and not the others. So I think, I mean, I've, you know, I wouldn't be doing this job. I built my job on globalization. And I, it horrifies me uh, to see some of the um, political leaders, you know, including our own country in the UK. I try not to com comment on other people's politics, but I think you're entitled to come to talk about your own. Yeah, and Brexit and all of this, you know, and uh, uh, to isolate yourself is a, is, is a real backward step. And I think what we can do as communicators, we actually have a really critical role which is to communicate the benefits of collaboration and working together for a mutual benefit. Uh, and if we can do that, then we have globalization with a much more human face. Um, and let's not lose sight of its benefits uh, just because uh, it can be abused. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, uh, that was really, really excellent, Julian. Um, and a lot of people in the chat have said that it was, you know, really thought provoking and they've enjoyed the session. Um, we don't have time for any more questions right now. Um, I'm going to share Julian's contact details if you would like to speak with him directly or if you'd like to send him your question, um, feel free to talk to him. Um, he'd be really happy to chat to you. I, I know he would. Oh, gosh, sorry. Here you are. Um,
So I'd like to just say a really big thanks to everyone for coming, that we hope you enjoyed it. And from your comments, I know that many of you did, so that's great. Um, as per usual, we'll be hosting the webinars at the same time every Wednesday. So the next one will be held on the 15th of July on the topic of thriving after the crisis, which I'm sure is a topic on many of your minds. We'll be joined by Esther Carter. She is a partner at Moore Kingston Smith in London. Moore Kingston Smith London is the best known financial accounting firm in the market and communications agency sector. Esther will be providing a financial perspective on the COVID-19 crisis for agency leaders. By now, agencies have adjusted to the shock of the unexpected pandemic for the most part. However, now is the time to plan for the longer term not just the new normal of video conferencing and increased remote working, but also the financial fundamentals of your agency. Esther's presentation will focus on resetting your agency for growth with a particular focus on a more strategically sound approach to business development. She will draw on qualitative research into what the critical success factors for a thriving business are and share some, of, some results of a very recent survey on the financial impact of the pandemic on agencies. Now, future web webinar Wednesdays can be found on our website under events at www.thenetwork1.com forward slash webinars and you can hopefully see it on screen. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Um, really glad that you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you all did. Um, we hope to see you at another webinar Wednesday very soon and have a great day everyone. Bye for now.